We're here in the India Club. Uh, it is a part of our shared history with India. It's an important part of London history as well. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, and Smith, I did mention 1928 is a really important year. Uh, that was the year that uh, that the India Club was born. The um, India League. The India League, sorry. And it was the aim of the India League was to campaign for full independence um, and self-government for India. Um, there are a huge plethora of really interesting characters involved, which I'll follow up with later. Um, but I guess what I wanted to know is a little bit more about your father's involvement um, and with a bit more about the kind of stories that he would tell you when you were growing up. I think Smith has told the story rather well, so that I don't have a whole lot to add. Uh, Dad came here as a student. Um, Krishna Menon, who was the founder, uh, head of the India League, uh, when he was here in 1928, had then become India's High Commissioner, the equivalent of ambassador, uh, after independence. And so uh, uh, he took this young Malayali student under his wing and, and uh, and my dad helped him. He, he was really the moving spirit behind creating a club where Indians could get together uh, and have affordable meals. A picture there showing lots of young Indians in smart suits and black tie. I think that was a slightly earlier era of the India club uh, because uh, because by today, as you can see, it's a, it's a pleasant, small, rather affordable eatery um, rather than a, a posh dining club. But the fact is that it still was a place where Indians could gather and feel at home. And that, I think, is is the spirit in which he does. But we had lots of distinguished English people also coming to some of these events. And we've got some pictures um, of dad and mom later when he married her and brought her back at India Club events with, with, with people uh, here. So it, it was a, already in the 50s when the Indian population was minuscule, a significant uh, gathering place. Um, now, of course, um, the Indian presence uh, in, in London has come a long way. Uh, but people don't realize how far back it goes, you know. I mean, the, the first record we have of an Indian in England uh, goes back to the burial in 1550 of a man called Solomon Noor, N-O-R-R, N-U-R-R, maybe Noor, Noor, whatever, uh, who was buried at St. Margaret's Church in Westminster in 1550. And the first known baptism of an Indian in England was a chap called Peter Pope, was baptized by no less than the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1610. So you've really got a history of an Indian presence here that is huge and that predates the arrival of the first British envoy in India, who was Sir Thomas Rowe, who showed up in 1614 and presented his credentials to the Emperor Jahangir. Yes. So yeah. we've got a, a rather old relationship, yeah. pre-colonial as well. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, I've been doing lots of research about the early Indian presence and right. one of the really interesting sources for that is that when uh, there would be kind of page boys and servants that people would uh, people yes. would bring over and there are adverts in newspapers when they would run away um, and the descriptions that they have of these page boys is really really fascinating and, they, and the names that they gave them and things like that so you're absolutely right that we have a presence in this country that is far earlier than most people would ever know. And it was always various kinds. You're quite right about the page boys and servants. Yeah. There were also Laskars or Yes, of course, and Ayers as well. Sailors, yeah. exactly, who came here and they too yeah. uh, often disappeared into the woodwork. Um, there were people who set up businesses. In fact, in the in the late 1700s, there was a man from Bihar called Sheikh Dean Muhammad yeah, with the shampoo, uh, yeah. who um, uh, set up something called the Hindustani yeah. Coffee House. Yeah but who was more famous for having introduced the concept of the shampoo yep. to England. <laughs> uh, so the, the first spas in England, including yep. one in Brighton, yep. another one in Kent, and of course several in London, were owned by Sheikh Dean Muhammad. And, uh, and, and um, they were called, what were they called, shampoo houses? Yeah, they were, yeah. And, and, everyone, and, and yeah. basically people came and sort of took baths, which is not a particularly favorite British pastime, as you might know. <laughs> I think once a week was the norm, but uh, at Sheikh Dean Muhammad's, you know, probably... But it's interesting because there, there are lots of illustrations of him in, you know, the London Illustrated News, for example, and things like he that. He had so a British were, wife as yeah, well. Yeah, so uh, people were very wife. aware of his, the, of his Indian origin, etc. Yeah. as well. Oh, he wrote a book too. Yes. He wrote yeah. a memoir yeah. this time in, in India. So if we, could go, if we could go back in time and you could visit the India Club in a bygone era, who would you love to have sat down and had a drink with? Well, I think Krishna Menon. Krishna okay. Menon was quite a character. I mean, he didn't suffer fools gladly. So he, you know, I might have encountered the mm -hmm. wrong end of his tongue, but he, <laughs> uh, he was actually uh, uh, quite a wit, mm -hmm. quite, uh, quite a sharp, intelligent yep. person. And though he was a, 
a high commissioner and officially you're supposed to have a, a Jaguar or a Rolls or something to travel in. He personally was comfortable taking the bus down from uh, from his place. He, he never stayed in the fancy ambassadorial residence, being content with a, a room above the above the office uh, in Aldwych, the High Commission. Uh, quite a character. And um, it is said that when uh, an Englishman, uh, thinking she was being kind, complimented him on his English, uh, he snapped back, Madam, my English is much better than yours. <laughs> you merely picked it up. I learned it. <laughs> What would you ask him? Oh, I think there was too much to ask him about because he was in many ways the man who shaped mm -hmm. India's presence in the world, but did it with such a, a sort of sharp tongue that Time magazine put him on the cover, an honor they hadn't yet, you know, they never did for Mahatma Gandhi in his lifetime. Uh, and they called him Mephistopheles in a Savile Row suit. <laughs> that was the, the description of Krishna Menon. The, the West was never very happy with him because he, he did have a sharp tongue and he he spoke up. And you know, those were the days in which um, India, having won independence after 200 years of servitude, uh, was determined to carve its own path in the world. Didn't want to be a part of um, any alliance, which the West couldn't fully appreciate. But for them, it was a question of self-respect. You know, for 200 years, others decided for us what our stand would be in the world. We're not going to surrender our autonomy of decision making to an alliance. And so that whole business of what we call sovereign autonomy uh, and strategic autonomy of the phrases that are used about this, that really originated at that time. And it's amongst its strongest exponents uh, were, of course, Prime Minister Nehru himself and Krishna Menon. So uh, I suppose I would love to have talked world affairs with him at that time. He did some remarkable things. He got India involved in a number of, uh, number of uh, global crises and helped extricate them. And there was one famous thing that he was involved in for which the West never gave him enough credit, which was that um, uh, two American airmen in a U-2, a spy plane, were shot down over China. And the Americans couldn't negotiate with the Chinese because they didn't recognize communist China in those days. Uh, they recognized only Taiwan as the Republic of China. So um, they turned to the UN Secretary General, but he couldn't help them because uh, communist China was not a member of the UN either. It was again Taiwan that occupied the China seat. Uh, so Hammarskjöld, the UN Secretary General, called Krishna Menon, who was the leader of the Indian delegation in the UN, said, can you help? Because you do deal with the Chinese. And Krishna Menon went to China and negotiated the release of these American airmen when America was at fever pitch and thought that these fellows might get executed for spying and so on. And Krishna Menon got them out. So he's quite a, quite a character and a very interesting one too. I'm writing that down because I'm going to teach my students that now because that is a fascinating that's a fascinating story yep. so it like, relates to my next question actually i was talking to your sister about this earlier and i heard you talking about it on lbc last week as well so i would like to make uh, to to say that i teach i'm a secondary school teacher by day a uh, history teacher and i teach a huge amount of his indian history to my students um so in year eight when the students are about 12 years old i teach this uh, we teach the students about the mughal uh, the mughal empire because for me it's really important to not just teach uh, India through the eyes of the British, but yeah. to t make sure that the students understand what came before. So we love teaching the students about the Mughals. We, we show them a picture of Thomas Rowe and teach them about all the different emperors. We go through, obviously, the East India Company. They learn about the Raj. Um, we obviously go to partition. Um, and then I, it's also if really important. read my book. <laughs> well, I've, well, I've got a, so this is my very, this is my well-loved copy from my classroom. And you can tell it's from my classroom because it's ripped to shreds well as well. Um, and I was actually teaching my year eights today about the Amritsar massacre, about Jalian Um So that's what I teach in my year eights, but I also teach Indian history at A-level as well. Mm. And the students have to answer a coursework question, mm. an essay question, and I want to ask you what your conclusion would be to the question. So, and I'd like everyone else to think about what your answer would be as well. So my students have to write a four and a half thousand word essay, and obviously mm. you've not got four and a half thousand words, but what would your conclusion be to this question? which is within the years 1847 to 1947, uh, to what extent was Indian independence due to nationalist agitation? Well, I mean, it's, it's a very challenging question to answer yeah. because there are multiple factors yeah, always. Yeah. The nationalist agitation did have a profound impact on public opinion, both within India in terms of raising public consciousness and around the world in terms of generating support and goodwill, for example, in a country like America, and also in Britain, where, for example, the Labour Party was largely sympathetic to the Indian nationalists and the Conservatives were not. But having said that, the British, if they wanted to hold on, had the capacity to do so, though they were 
engaged in a very slow process of gradually associating Indians more and more with governance. It's, you remember the yes minister uh, things where, you know, uh, when, when the, the bureaucrat is ordered to do something he doesn't want to do and he says, Yes, Minister, in the fullness of time and after due deliberation, we shall in due course, after taking into account all available factors, we shall consider all the points and, of course, we will appropriately arrive at a suitable conclusion to take the matter forward. You know, that's, all, that's what the British were trying to do. So they, way back at the beginning of the 20th century, they pledged increasingly associating Indians with responsible self-governance. And as late as 30 years later, uh, when the Government of India Act was passed in response to Indian nationalist agitation, in 1935, and elections were held in 36-37, in there still were elections with a limited franchise. Uh, uh, India had about 300 million people, I suppose, and something like um, 5 or 10 million people, maybe slightly more, were allowed to vote. Uh, those who had property, those who had an education, but the British had made sure that very few had a, an adequate education. So you had to have, a, I think you had to have, a, uh, a, if I'm not mistaken, a college degree, at the very least a high school, a high school uh, graduation equivalent, uh, or property of substantial size in order to be able to vote. So we're still a very limited franchise and so on. Um, having said that, um, though the British um, <laughs> were slow in sort of eking out these, um, these, these uh, sort of privileges of democracy to the Indians, it was gradually going and at that pace it would eventually have come. But what certainly accelerated it to come in 47 was the extraordinary toll that World War II took on the British. Uh, the British were an exhausted nation. They'd been bombed uh, in, and blitzed, literally. A uh, lot of England was in ruins. There was rationing that continued well into the time. My father tells stories of, of going through rationing for everything, you know, newspapers, boots, bread, everything was rationed when he came to this country. Um, and so um, it was, and, and that too, they were in colossal debt. Uh, they had phenomenal debts, including to India uh, and to other countries that borrowed money from for the war effort. So they were they were really in bad shape. And then in 1945, there was, or 46, 45, uh, there was the Indian naval mutiny. When three uh, Indian ships, the, the Indian sailors captured the ships and turned their cannons on British installations in the port. Uh, they'd already been uh, Indian prisoners of war uh, turning si sides and joining the Japanese against the British uh, earlier. So the British began to worry that in order to hold India at a time when Indians are willing to use arms against them, in addition to the Gandhian non-violent civil disobedience and so on, that they would need a colossal investment in men and resources to hold India down. That they weren't going to be able to do it with the level of resources they had at that time, with an exhausted army. Uh, many of those men were looking forward to being demobilized. It just, it, it, it would have required a deeply unpopular political decision to send more troops to India. So they went the other way. And don't forget in 1945, exhausted Britain voted warmongering Churchill out and brought in, uh, you know, peace loving Attlee in with all the talk of, uh, of, of, a, of a welfare state uh, in the election manifesto. And so for them, their priority was domestic. And so Churchill's, I mean, uh, Attlee's orders were to get rid of uh, the problem by granting India independence. In fact, when Mountbatten was sent out here, he was told by June 48. But when Mountbatten got there and he found things had, when the prospect of independence had, had made things accelerate, he then advanced it with his fabled vanity to a date that meant something to him, the date that he, as Supreme Allied Commander in the Pacific, had accepted the surrender of the Japanese August 15th. Uh, so he had accepted the, the, the surrender on August 15, 1945. So he said August 15, 1947 will grant independence. Uh, it was it was entirely Mountbatten's thing, but it also reflected the fact that the British couldn't get out of there soon enough. It was the first BRICS Brexit, and even messier <laughs> than the Brexit you saw here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I that's th 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 that those are exactly the things that my students argue, and I think one of the things that's just struck me is. That, Britain found themselves in a very different scenario to the one that they'd been in in 1857, right? Where actually they had no means to hold on to India anymore. I mean, they had the means, but it would cost them an enormous amount of deployment. Although they didn't have the will. They didn't exactly. have the will to. The will had yeah. failed. Yeah. Only definitely. because of World War II. Yes, absolutely. And, and yeah, that's, it's, it's the economy in World War II that all of my students conclude is, the, is one of the key factors. So that you'd fit in very well with my class, Shashi, uh, with, your, with your answer there. Which maybe Do I get an A? <laughs> <laughs> get an A star, actually, maybe. <laughs> uh, so talking of, uh, talking of 
kind of independence and partition. It, obviously, we've, the summer's coming very soon. We've got the anniversary um, of Indian independence and partition. And since last year, um, some have observed on, a, uh, on August the 14th, uh, what's now deemed as, uh, quote, partition horrors remembrance day. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that um, and whether you think that's a helpful uh, way to kind of mark that time. So, yeah, I'd love to know what you think. You know, Objectively, there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. because there were horrors at the time of partition Absolutely. and there's no harm yeah. in remembering them. But unfortunately, there is an agenda behind the yeah. marking of this commemoration and it's an agenda intended to stoke up certain bitterness against a certain community mm -hmm. and to use that day to demonize the community mm -hmm. that demanded partition. Now that, unfortunately, is being done as part of a political agenda uh, by the ruling party. And that's the only reason I would disapprove it. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those who said in the context of Inglorious Empire that you must forget, forgive but never forget. Uh, I do believe every society has to remember, owes itself, as it were, the debt of historical memory. But uh, to use it, to use history, as sort of a, a sharp edge to sort of claw at wounds that were healed or were healing is, I think, most unfortunate. And I can't say that I have much, um, shall we say, sympathy for, for that kind of motive. Um, the remembrance of history is important. I mean, I think the, the anniversary of Jallianwala Bagh should be commemorated, for example. It hardly is. Uh, but um, but um, I do think that, uh, that using it to demonize the community is, is deplorable. How have your how have your kind of family traditionally marked kind of independence? Is there any is there anything in particular? Well, we, that you know, we we all sort of got caught up uh, as children mm -hmm. in school activities on Independence right. Day. Uh, somebody would come and raise the flag, mm -hmm. some VIP guest, and we'd all mm -hmm. go there and sing patriotic songs. It was actually a holiday, so right. that was about all that really happened. People went off and saw movies and had a good <laughs> time, and that's again part of the problem. You know that right. that um, the I mean I am in favour of not having public holidays on important occasions, but rather using that day right. to do something meaningful. And the Vietnamese mm -hmm. apparently, uh, on Ho Chi Minh's birthday, mm. will stop all work for one minute to pay tribute to him and, and about then they go right back to work. <laughs> and you know, I, I suggested, uh, not irreverently, very seriously on Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, this is a man who said, work is worship. How can you not work on his birthday? Why are we taking a holiday on Mahatma Gandhi's birthday? For people, it was just an excuse for a long weekend or a picnic or whatever, you know. Um, so I actually uh, would have liked to have seen us honoring Mahatma Gandhi by working extra hard on his birthday. But needless to say, I was disowned by everybody, including my own party on that one. So I haven't repeated the suggestion since. <laughs> I'm sure everyone here would support that. Um, so to go, to go back to my wonderful uh, A-level class. So I every year, I send them your Oxford Union speech to listen to before I start teaching them about Indian independence. So what I'd like to know is why do you think that speech made such, had the impact that it did? I honestly didn't expect it. I mean, I tweeted it uh, when, when the Oxford Union sent mm -hmm. me the, the video link. Um, and I was astonished to see the numbers shooting up uh, mm -hmm. on the on the sort of retweets yeah. and likes column. It was downloaded three million times in, in 24 hours. Yeah. And I found myself going to schools where mm. it was almost being played on a loop uh, in, in, in sort of assembly yeah. halls and so on. A university by December had held an entire uh, uh, sort of all day long seminar mm. on the issue. And I genuinely couldn't believe it because I, I thought uh, that these were things that everybody knew. Yeah. Uh, but apparently they didn't, or they weren't right. paying attention in class, or right. they hadn't put it all together. <laughs> they didn't have me as a history teacher, that's what that's When my Indian <laughs> publisher called me saying, you've got to make a book out of this, I said, yeah. you're silly, everyone knows this stuff. And he said, of course they don't. They don't. They if they don't. did, your speech wouldn't have gone viral. Yeah. And that's yeah. what uh, uh, talked me into writing yeah. what became Inglorious mm. Empire. Yeah, it's interesting because people say that to me all the time about people kind of apologize. I find, do you, do you find this people often apologize to me sort of saying, I, I, I'm so sorry, I didn't know this history. Yeah. And my response is always, don't apologize because you're here now. And also, I also say to them that the problem is, is that this information oddly is not widely or readily available. You know, and I think that's part of the problem. You know, we watch films about World War One, for example, and there's no there's no evidence there of the tens of thousands of Indian soldiers that died in the trenches, for example. Um, so I think that people often can become apologists about this, but actually, if they're there, willing to learn, willing to listen, and that's the main thing, I think, definitely. Um, 
So those are, my, those are my questions about the past. I'm going to ask you some questions about the present now. Um, so related, exactly related to what we just said. So how might a greater understanding of Britain's history with India impact the relationship between those two countries? But also how might it impact the kind of the West commentary on India? Because I know on LBC you mentioned there was a discussion that you had about the fact that there's not a huge amount of coverage necessarily about, about India. So would a greater understanding of Britain's relationship with India help with that, do you think? Now, where? You mean in India or in Britain? In, uh, in Britain, I suppose, first? Well, in Britain, I think that there isn't very much mm -hmm. understanding, largely because I don't think it's taught very much. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're teaching all this in, in school and for A-levels, because I met a number of people when Inglorious Empire mm -hmm. came out who told me that they hadn't studied yeah. any mm -hmm. of British colonial history yeah. Which I didn't for their A-levels yeah. in history and yeah, in some of absolutely. the most prestigious yeah. schools yeah. in this city. And I met a Pakistani writer, I think we had dinner together, Michael, if you remember, who had a child who just had a had his A-levels at either St. Paul's or Westminster, one of these really fancy he, he hadn't yeah. heard a, learned a word of Indian history. Yeah, so absolutely. there is undoubtedly a problem yes. uh, uh, that explains the historical amnesia mm -hmm. that Brits yeah. seem to feel. Uh, it explains why a YouGov poll I consulted just before writing this yeah. book Another actually one. <laughs> had something like 59% of yeah. young Britons under yeah. 25 saying they thought empire was a good, was thing, a good thing and they'd love to have it back. Yeah. Um, and you yeah. know, you want to kick these fellows it's uh, shocking. in a sense it's it a is place. shocking. But yeah. the truth is that it's, 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 it's a reflection of their mm -hmm. ignorance rather than their yeah. malevolence. Yes. They don't know any better, yeah. but somebody has to tell them. I pointed out that, you know, London is a city full of museums. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they're all thieves markets, uh, chore bazaars, as we call them in <laughs> India. They're full of things purloined from our ancestors, but, but, uh, but there isn't a museum to colonialism. There's nothing that depicts the history and the reality of colonialism that school children can come to, that tourists can come to and visit and see for themselves. There's a war museum, but it's all about the great imperial success. The imperial war museum is all about imperial military conquest, not about what happened to the poor victims of it. Yeah. So, I mean, these are things that I think could be remedied in a more enlightened Britain. We're not there yet, but it'll come. You've got Gandhi out in a statue uh, on a plinth and, and that's uh, unthinkable at the time that he was alive and even for a long time after he died. So something has happened. But perhaps one day we will have a museum to colonialism. I'd love to see that happening. Uh, the other thing that I'd say is that um, that awareness might also contribute to a more enlightened um, set of policies towards India. I mean, I, I, the, the media, for example, uh, tends uh, to be somewhat condescending. I, mean, I, I think the daily, every time India does something military, uh, you know, launches, uh, it sets off a nuclear bomb or I mean, a, a nuclear test uh, or, uh, or, 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 you know, shoots a missile or whatever. The Daily Mail will carry some articles about how British aid is being wasted. I mean, British aid wouldn't have, you know, paid for the fuse on that, on that, uh, on that, on that nuclear test. But the point is that uh, there is that condescension that's built into the relationship that we need to outgrow. And I think that that will be healthy for Britain to know more and, and to be aware of more. Uh, after Inglorious Empire was published, a good couple of years later, uh, a British Indian professor, a Patnaik at, in London, uh, came out with a study that established, because I said in the book that, uh, that you know, you, you can't really compute what Britain did to India, especially you can't put a price on human lives because of the 35 million unnecessary deaths caused by famines that were created by British policy and sustained by British policy in India. Uh, how do you put a price on 35 million lives? And then plus all the other money drained out and so on. I said, look, I mean, uh, as far as reparations is concerned, no payable amount is credible and no credible amount is payable. So let's forget it. Uh, she actually worked out what the amount would be. And she said it would be actually be 45 trillion pounds. She's published an entire book working out the calculator. Now, the entire GDP of Britain is 3 trillion pounds. So it's like, you know, everyone in Britain would have to work for 15 years to give everything to India to repay those 200 years of colonial extraction. Obviously, no one wants that. It can't be done. It won't be done. But it's a, it's a sense of a, of a measure of how much was taken out of India. And if Britain had that awareness, I've quoted in this book, uh, Horace Walpole taking a horse carriage down a prominent street. I've named the street. I can't remember it now. Literally counting mansion after mansion built, as he says, on the proceeds of Indian wealth, of money drained out of India and spent here. Um, and there were Englishmen who were aware of this at the time and who, who were critical of, of British loot and particularly of East India Company. But the truth is that uh, it's all been forgotten now. And, and uh, 
though it's a wonderful thing that the two countries were able to uh, part without acrimony and that there was very, very little bitterness uh, associated with the act of, uh, of independence. Um, nonetheless, I think a certain awareness would help in terms of Britain having a more responsible attitude to its relations with India. I think the problem is, what you've just said reminds me of the fact that anyone that tries to do that gets caught up in the culture wars. Mm. So the National Trust, for example, are doing absolutely, everyone should, should support the National Trust in this room because they're doing fantastic work to really dig deep into where so many of uh, the, the money that these, that all these beautiful country houses are built on. And there's a huge amount of work they're doing about the connections between the East India Company, for example, and lots of houses around the country. And they are constantly being shut down by the government. They are being, you know, they're, they're being slated in various newspapers, etc. as well. And they're, they're doing brilliant work and it, that people are trying to do it. But unfortunately, there's still such a wall up that because people, some people just don't want to hear, well, certain, certain areas of the, of the country, they don't want to hear it. And I think that's the, that's you know, the problem, it, it, isn't it? it? It's interesting. You're right. Some people don't want to hear it. Mm. And, and some people want to hear, hear, hear less often. Yes. For example, when this book was launched here, we had a, a discussion at the v and Right. Yeah. Uh, whose director, Tristan Hunt, mm -hmm. was in dialogue with me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I pointed out that a heck of a lot of his uh, yeah. uh, items on display, including the famous Tipu Tipu's, Sultan Tiger, yes, Tipu's Tiger. Uh, yep. uh, were all purloined from India mm -hmm. and there wasn't any real acknowledgement of that yep. there. Now, I gather that subsequently there was a debate in the VNA about mm -hmm. this and uh, they have now, I gather, I mean, all the displays are very much there, nothing's being returned to India, but they have apparently more elaborate inscriptions mm -hmm. describing the circumstances mm -hmm. in which these items were brought yeah. to, to Britain and then displayed in yeah. the VNA. Now, that's, that's progress of a it kind. It is. It's a good first step. Yeah. Absolutely. So at least the people that are there can know know the true origins rather than acquired from India. And there's no real there's no real awareness of how exactly. Still under the point of a dagger. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so going back to the present. So in a world where that we can all identify with this, where in a world where kind of identity politics, echo chambers, etc., can sometimes I think hinder our ability to debate in a healthy kind of way and have open discussion. So how do you think this has impacted Indian politics? but also kind of politics further afield as well. I'm not sure it's impacted Indian politics okay. very much. I mean, I know that uh, everyone was astonished that my speech actually was one of the very few moments in the last eight years when there was actually bipartisan uh, response <laughs> to something in that uh, uh, for once the BJP, which, you know, they took a, deep a, a very short breather mm. from attacking me daily to actually praise something I'd said. And the prime minister, no less, was kind enough to say, uh, here's an example of someone saying the right thing in the right place at the right time, which was extremely flattering and I was deeply touched. But um, uh, that was about the end of it. I think okay. the next day I criticized the government for uh, uh, using the death penalty on sure a convicted uh, terrorist enabler. And I was promptly right. back to being the favorite whipping boy of the same trolls who just praised me for 24 hours. But still, um, no, it didn't have an impact on Indian politics. I'd say that the kind of awareness um, a raising that the book, I'm proud to say, has contributed to. That's there and people are aware of it. And to this day now, five years later, six years later, uh, I have people coming up to me uh, acknowledging that speech, or having heard that speech, or having read the book that came from the speech. So there's all of that. And that's something that's immensely gratifying. But, um, but it's not, I would say, today a, a major preoccupation. When um, my campaign for an apology on the centenary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre culminated in a somewhat wishy-washy statement of regret by the Prime Minister of the House of Commons, but not an apology. Um, there wasn't a huge reaction or fuss in India. Um, and, and I must say that if I were to look at it, I think people have in some significant ways moved on. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay. So I find that, I find that really interesting because uh, so I haven't, so my, on my school lan lanyard, um, I wear a marigold pin and a poppy pin every day mm. because marigold, a mar marigold is the flower of remembrance uh, that India have chosen. I wear it every day. And if students ask me, I always explain why. So the students always ask me, um, how, how are these, how are these days kind of commemorated in India? And obviously I actually taught Jalin Wanabag today. Mm. So it's really interesting to hear that that there you would, I don't know, I guess, I, I guess living here, I would assume that there would be a bigger response. Um, in India to, to those things and, um, and especially things like Remembrance Day, for example, I know it's not massively marked I think it's in partially India, because it? Indians have taken it for granted. Yes. Besides, yeah, okay. you know, we won our independence, yeah. so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's no longer a sore point. Yeah. 
Um, I'm sorry to say that there are people in India who probably don't know the British were ever there. So, right. you know, things things yeah. are uh, different in a mm. country. Like yeah. I think um, we don't have like, levels of education, mm -hmm. sophisticated awareness of the world and of history that we can have a right to expect right. Yeah. Uh, from a more compact, educated mm -hmm. population. Yeah. yeah. Inter very interesting. Uh, so when I, sp I suppose thinking, I guess thinking toward a bit more towards the future. So what should India's role in the world be? Ah, well, I, I think India has a tremendous capacity to play a much bigger role in the world than it's playing now mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. In fact, uh, Lister, I actually floated the concept of multi alignment. Um, I said we move beyond non-alignment to, non to multi-alignment. It kind of fell with a thud and no one picked it up. But years later, our current foreign minister, Jay Shankar, who was a, a diplomat for our government at the time, referred to it and used the phrase again quite recently in a speech in Delhi. So I I'm, I'm feel it might be coming back. I mean, the idea is that if you think of international relations rather than like the way we think about the World Wide Web, it's a series of networked relations. It's not the binary era of the Cold War when it was either you're on this side or you're on that side or some of you are non-aligned between the two. That's, that's, that was the only way you could see the world. Today, you can be in a multiple series of network relationships where I'm connected with you for something, you're connected with her for something, and I may not necessarily be connected with her because I don't know her, but we're all connected in different ways for different purposes. So India, for example, uh, can incorporate, because of its own history and its, and its interests, it can incorporate very divergent sets of priorities in these multiple network relationships. We're in the G77. We, in fact, we've led it very often, the global trade union of developing countries, but we're also in the G20, the global management of the world macro economy. Uh, we're clamoring for a seat in the Security Council of the seven members, but we are a loud voice uh, for, the, for the 193 General Assembly membership. We are in the non-aligned movement where we rail against the colonial powers, and we are at the same time in the community of democracies alongside most of those colonial powers, which are, of course, all democracies today. And so it goes. Or uh, to take a different set of examples, India meets every year with Russia and China in something called the RIC. Then we add the Brazilians and the South Africans and you have BRICS. Uh, then you subtract the Russians and the Chinese and you have IPSA for South-South cooperation. And then to IPSA, you add the Chinese, but not the Russians. And you have BASIC for environmental negotiations. And India is the only country that belongs to all these different configurations, and not merely because its name begins with that indispensable element in every acronym, a vowel, <laughs> but also because it really has something different to contribute to each and something different to gain from each. So that's the kind of, and I think that if you look at India's capacities, um, it's ready to be a rule maker, or one of the rule makers, rather than just a rule taker, subject of other people's rules. It's got, for example, the expertise, the knowledge, in everything from cyberspace to outer space to contribute to the framing of global ways of doing things. It's been, I think, unnecessarily reticent. It needs to get up there and be more active. So, is that, so what do you see, I suppose, is the biggest, the biggest obstacle to what you would like to see India's role being? I think it's our own, um, uh, our, our own diffidence. I think okay. our government, successive governments, I don't exempt my own, and mm -hmm. I, I certainly uh, don't let the present government off, mm -hmm. has, have been insufficiently, uh, shall we say, courageous in standing mm -hmm. up uh, for India's right yeah. to be heard, to be consulted, to be listened to, and to, um, and to, to, to uh, come up with original ideas mm -hmm. that others will have to take as seriously as we've mm -hmm. taken their ideas for 75 years after yeah. the Second World War. So, as a proud member of the diaspora, what role do you, should the diaspora have moving forward, particularly in relation to kind of young uh, British Indians being the sort of living bridge between Britain and India? I think the diaspora is indispensable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, there, there's a joke, I mean, that uh, the, the NRIs, as the Indian <laughs> passport holders of the diaspora were called, yeah. um, uh, NRIs being non-resident Indians, as you all know, I think the Indians here will know that, that uh, some people said, well, the question is, are they not really Indian, or is it a case of never relinquished India? And they really were a bit of both. Uh, uh, they were not really Indian, they weren't living there, dealing with the daily challenges and frustrations we all go through. They were abroad, but they had never given up their affinity to India. And I must say, even many who've adopted foreign passports for their own convenience and because their lives have been settled in, in other countries, 
in their heart they're still very Indian, but India doesn't permit dual citizenship, so they're forced to give up their Indian passport. Now, I suggested after seeing uh, how indispensable the national diaspora has been to India's growth and development, that NRI really was the National Reserve of India, <laughs> because you've got all these, uh, all these diaspora elements doing everything we'd like them to do. They stay aware, they care about the issues, they, um, they sometimes agitate, they increase awareness about these issues in Western countries or other countries where they are. They send money home, of course, remittances are, are somewhere in the neighborhood of $80 billion a year cumulatively from all the Indian diaspora. They uh, invest a lot of the people who we used to deplore as a brain drain out of India have become a brain gain because they invest back in India. Many a computer firm in Bangalore was started by somebody in Silicon Valley who made his millions there, having been part initially of the brain drain. So all of these things, to my mind, are very positive. And I'd say that in today's day and age, when there's so easy communication, um, whether it's, you know, daily communication by, by email and telephone and WhatsApp and all of that, um, as well as the ease of travel, that there is absolutely, uh, to my mind, um, nothing preventing the diaspora from being as involved in India as they may wish to be. And I would urge them all to stay involved and to get as involved. I mean, for many people, it's as if they never left. I mean, they've got family members and friends, of course, still there. But it's so easy to come and go and stay in touch that they happen to be working in England, but they, they you know, part of their mind and their heart and perhaps their bank accounts are theirs too. So I welcome that. So I feel like I can't not ask you about uh, the books that are sitting behind us. So tell, can you tell us a little bit about your, about your new book and what the motivation was uh, for writing it? Well, I wanted to write a book on nationalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Indian title is The Battle of Belonging, okay. because it was actually the first hundred pages are really a study of mm -hmm. the concept, theory and practice of nationalism mm -hmm. worldwide. And then the remainder is about how nationalism uh, worked in India, both in the national movement, then mm -hmm. in the, uh, then in the, in the, in the, um, independent struggle mm -hmm. and finally the constitution itself, what kind of nationalism was created and now the sort of stresses and strains in reinterpreting nationalism under the present ruling party, which has a very different concept of nationalism than the one that had prevailed for the preceding six and a half decades before they came to power. So you've got, you've got a study of nationalism first globally and then in the Indian context. Uh, Michael felt that he was publishing a book really about India mainly, and he wanted India in the title, and this is where we, we came out of the struggle for India's soul. And I will say that, you know, three-fourths of the book is about <laughs> India. Uh, but that first fourth is also important to me because um, Indians have been concerned about nationalism since before we were free. Uh, Tagore's lectures on nationalism, which I've quoted, uh, go back to, the, uh, to 1917. And, and they, were, they were very important Statements, of course, I don't agree with Tagore. In fact, probably today hardly anyone does because he was much more interested in universal humanism than in uh, a nationalism with territorial limits. But, uh, but still, um, there was an Indian engaging with these ideas. You've got Orwell's a dislike of nationalism. He comes from a slightly different place from Tagore and he was reacting very much to what he saw of, of, of German nationalism and, and the rise of fascism in the 30s. But to, uh, Orwell on nationalism is also quoted. Um, and I felt it was time to look at nationalism from a 21st century Indian perspective because we have lived through three kinds of nationalism. You have the nationalism, uh, the anti-colonial nationalism that animated the freedom struggle, where it was all about, you know, you folks have no business ruling us and telling us what to do. We'll look after our own problems. And as Gandhi said, leave us to God or to anarchy. It's not your problem. Why are you here? So that's the classic anti-colonial nationalism. But that was not what they put into the constitution. When they sat down at the time of the British departure and spent three years debating in great detail in the constituent assembly what kind of nation they wanted to create, they actually developed a very significant, sophisticated understanding of nationalism, which uh, today, if you want to be theoretical, you'd call civic nationalism. That is, it is not a nationalism anchored in identity. If anti-colonial nationalism said, we're Indian, you're not, you get out. Civic nationalism says, your nationalism as an Indian and your rights as a citizen of India have nothing to do with your color, your religion, your language, your region, where you were born. It inheres in the constitution and in the institutions created by the constitution. And that's what we understand by civic national. America has it. At that point, no European country had it, but America is the one example of civic nationalism before India. And it was a very, to my mind, an incredibly progressive idea, an idea that I welcomed. It also meant 
that in a country with all the challenges India had, including caste and and, and we just come out of a terrible traumatic partition on the basis of religious identity, you are actually saying, no, these identities don't matter. It is you as an individual who have rights in this country and you as an individual who is permitted by this constitution to develop your full personality and to determine your own political destiny. It's a wonderful, wonderful document. <coughs> and that was what, with all the imperfections we tried to practice and fulfill uh, right up to 2014. In 2014, you had a party winning a majority for the first time. It had been in power earlier, but without a majority and as part of a coalition government. But for the first time, a party winning a majority that actually explicitly in its own party uh, philosophy did not believe in this idea of nationalism. It believed instead that India was a Hindu Rashtra or should be a Hindu Rashtra, uh, a, a land of the Hindu religious, uh, the people who subscribe to Hindi, Hindu identity, culturally, cultural identity. And so in this book, I talk about uh, that, that different version of, of, of nationalism that this party stands for. And I talk about some of the steps they've taken in their eight years. Actually, this book was written when they were about six and a half years into power, uh, seven uh, more or less. Um, what they were doing, uh, what they have done so far, right up to and including, of course, the assimilation of Kashmir by the abolition of three, Article 370 of the Constitution, all that in order to promote their of Hindu nationalism. Uh, that actually remains fairly contemporary because then COVID happened and sort of everything has been more or less uh, in limbo since, including there have been no significant political developments on any of the issues I've discussed in the book. So the book has stayed topical because uh, COVID has meant that there's been no acceleration of the trends I've described and outlined. But that's that's the, uh, the, the theme of the book. So it will be of interest to people who are interested in directly Temporary politics, and it's of interest to who want to grapple with the notion uh, of nationalism, uh, what it means, what it has meant elsewhere, and what it could mean uh, today and tomorrow in India. It's also a more anecdotal book uh, than some of my other writing. It's, it may, I may, may have made it sound a bit scholarly. It's not. I mean, it's, it's got a lot of research and footnotes and all of that where, where needed. If you, but it, it's written as a very subjective one person's uh, account of his own encounter with Indian nationalism. I was born in London uh, and as, as a result, I'm entitled to a British passport, which I have never sought. Um, and, and there was a time when I would go to British embassies or consulates abroad um, and be told, why do you want to pay 65 pounds for a, an entry permit uh, when you can get a passport for 15? And I would say, but I don't want your passport. Thank you very much. Here's your 65 pounds. But I had to ask myself why? Uh, in what sort of uh, Indianness was I trying to set up? And so there's a lot of this, uh, this kind of thing in the book as well. So it is very much an interrogation. It has references to things that you may find familiar in this country, including Theresa May's uh, uh, memorable line that anyone who thinks he's a citizen of the world hasn't got the slightest idea what citizenship is all about, which I think actually deserves an entire debate at the Oxford Union one day. Well, that's another man. My final question before we go to the Q&A is not what you're going to write next, because we know you've got other books in you, but what would you like to write next? Well, I actually have written something, but it's not for Michael, I'm sorry to say. Manchester University Press wanted a, a short life of uh, Dr. Ambedkar for a series they're doing on really great lives in the developing world. And, um, and uh, my publisher in India wanted a, a, a book that was relevant for the 75th anniversary of India's independence. Mm. So I... I decided to sort of Amazing. kill two birds with one stone by agreeing to uh, to that project. And it's, it's going to be a short book, about 50,000 words, uh, that tells the essential elements of the life of Ambedkar and his legacy, what he stood for. Um, from my perspective mm -hmm. as somebody, yeah. uh, you know, at this point in the 21st century with a certain vision mm -hmm. uh, of, of Indian constitutionalism, <laughs> for, of which he was the great uh, architect, uh, as well as a, a certain vision of of ideas of social mm -hmm. justice and so on, which were, of course, the things that marked his life. Yeah. So it, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating sure. life. And yeah. I, think, uh, I think you'll all enjoy it. But it'll be out in India sooner than in Britain because mm -hmm. university presses are not mm -hmm. as fast and efficient as Michael Dwyer and Hearst here. So it will take a little while to come out. I very much look forward to reading that because I'm a big, big fan of them, but as are my year eights as well. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for letting me, indulging me in my uh, questions. Uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of time for some Q&A. My so, um, hands going so, up. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
My name is uh, Nitin Mehta. I was born in Kenya, but uh, very much love India and uh, this kind of the diaspora you are talking about. But uh, Shashi, I'm very worried that uh, your full potential has not been realized. You have, you have so much more to give to India. You could be the prime minister. Unfortunately, you're in the wrong party, which is completely dis discredited uh, and, and really going further down and down. BJP is the only party that you could come into, but obviously you have this inborn idea that Hindus are now demonizing some people. No, no, no. Or, I'm a Hindu. Uh, I don't yeah, demonize yeah. anybody. <laughs> no, you just mentioned that demonizing of a community. Uh, but uh, 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 Hindus cannot ever demonize anybody. What they were asking is actually what happened ju just recently. We had a jubilee celebration here in UK. Massive, as you know. The most important events were church services where the queen and the prime minister and all of them attended. Now, the majority of the Hindus in India are saying that please accord us that kind of respect that we are a, you know, millennia old culture in this land of ours. We accept all the minorities with their full rights, but please acknowledge us and acknowledge some of the values and ethos that we hold. That's all BJP is saying. Now we're talking about Kashmir and how many people ever talked about the Kashmir files before this film took, uh, came out? I mean, what happened to the Hindus there? And this is in a country that is supposed to be a majority Hindu country. So please, let's have some balance. Narendra Modi is not a warmonger or a hater anybody. He wants to pass a balance where Hindus are acknowledged. Yeah. Hindus are actually acknowledged for what they are. So Shashi, we want you to be somewhere so that you can be really, you know, your full potential can be realized. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. I really appreciate your, your kind help. I should say that... Um, I, I didn't say Hindus were demonized. I, th I said some people associated with a certain brand of politics have unfortunately uh, taken a stand of demonizing a particular community. Here's, if you like, the evidence of my being a very proud Hindu myself. But I sort of have drunk from my teenage years at the fount of Swami Vivekananda. And what he taught us was that Hinduism was a faith, not um, merely of tolerance, which... You know, we all learned in our history books, tolerance is a good thing and tolerance king is a good guy. But if you really think about it, tolerance is profoundly patronizing. What is the tolerant king saying? He's saying, I have the truth. You are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in your right to be wrong. That's all tolerance is. Whereas what Vivekanand tells us Hinduism is about is not tolerance. It's acceptance. It says, I believe I have the truth. You believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth. Please respect my truth. And to my mind, that's the most perfect recipe for living in a multi-religious and indeed multi-political party uh, country. Because you are acceptance, your acceptance of difference is accepting of other people, other people's right to be who they are. That's all I'm saying. So I expect my Muslim friends to value the fact that I am a Hindu and that I'm, I'm, I'm anchored in my faith and I'm proud of my faith and my culture. But equally, I give them the same respect. What I can't accept is the attitude that says, this is our country, you will be here on our terms, uh, and you're here only on our sufferance. That is wrong. And that's indeed not what the Constitution prescribes. So that's where the, the ideological difference comes. But Mr. Mehta, I think at bottom we can find constructive common ground. We have to take this country forward by focusing on what unites us and not what divides us. That's what I say to our friends in the ruling party. <laughs> Hi, I've got a question. I'm Saroop. Uh, I'm an actuary. Um, You're an actor? So, yeah. So Good. I'm kind of thinking more long term, perhaps, than <laughs> many people. But um, I guess I'm also a bit of an economist as well. Um, so my question is more, why can't India compete a bit more with China? And why can't India become the next China? And I saw it painfully over COVID in terms of supply chain, too much reliance on one country and monopoly, not a good thing for any economy. He's asking why can't India compete more with China? And the answer is we lost that race a long time ago and I, I'm not sure there's much to be said frankly now uh, for it uh, because um, up to about 1980 we had the same GDP which meant our per, per capita income was higher than theirs because we had fewer people. But uh, since then, uh, with Deng Xiaoping's reforms, 
they accelerated dramatically. They found the right strategy of becoming a, a manufacturing powerhouse for the rest of the world. Uh, they had a very strongly export driven global economy plugged in growth. And today their GDP is five times our GDP, um, which means that there is simply no way that you can conceivably catch up. Not that we can, because there's also, if you like, a cultural difference. Uh, the way in which the Chinese workers were able to go and do that work uh, in our country, we won't be able to. If we look at Chinese infrastructure. Uh, the fact is that if the Chinese wanted to construct a six lane highway, they went from zero six lane highways in 1996 to 100,000 kilometers of six lane highways by uh, 2016. And they did that <coughs> by drawing lines on a map and bulldozing every village in its path. Now, in India, you try to uh, expand a two lane road and you'll be tied up in court for 20 years. There'll be dharnas, objections, protests, people with flags marching, saying they won't surrender their land. Uh, there'll be film stars flying down to sit in sympathetic hunger strikes with them. Uh, I, all these have actually happened. So I'm just telling you, uh, this is how India is. As they say in India, we are like this only. So we are not going to be able to do the kinds of things China's done. But on the other hand, should we? Because China, um, uh, you know, has grown at breakneck speed, but it's broken a lot of necks in the process. And we'd rather not do that. That's not the Indian way. And I might add that at the end of the day, there's enough room for growth for all in the world at their own speed. If China wants to be a behemoth and we don't, I, all I want is for India to grow enough to be able to give its people three square meals a day and the hope and prospect of a better life for the next generation, education, health, clean living, clean air, all of those things that we don't currently uh, take for granted for every, every citizen of our population. If we can deliver that, how does it bother me how much better China is doing? Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess the Indian phrase is... Yeah, we're, we're not delivering that yet, so let's focus on that first. <laughs> if not today, then tomorrow. Tomorrow, how absolutely. You say that in Indian. Let's in, work for uh, that. Hindi. Yeah. yeah, there's a question here and then we come to you. So, uh, no, I really appreciated, uh, you know, some of the things that you said, because my, my son goes to secondary school right now. And I really think that in this country, there isn't enough of, uh, uh, you know, appreciation of both from, you know, not the colonial imperial history, but also the Indianness part of it, given that the Indian diaspora is so much a component of the society here. But uh, I think that that to me was a very interesting point, which I thought was quite unique that came out today, is this concept of the um, identity of the um, Indian diaspora in the Brit in Britain, for example, right? Because why is it important to me? Because my children, they were born here. They're now, you know, 15, 16. And and we've seen intergenerationally that whole concept of, you know, my identity, you know, what, what their identity is and therefore associating with that. Uh, but the point that you mentioned, which is, I think, Shashi, what you, what you said, um, the fact that in India, you know, the fact that Jallianwala Bagh massacre is not sort of, there is no remembrance day for that. In a way, probably, and I, I don't know, I would like to know your thoughts on that. It's probably, you know, I don't think we really need an apology or anything of that sort. I mean, in this country, in the UK right now, there's an element of being proud to be an Indian because of the fact that, oh, well, look, look at it this way. In the politics, after the prime minister, the next four sort of portfolios mm. are all from the Indian diaspora mm. in this country. Though. I mean, whether it's uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, Preeti Patel, Sajid Javed, and the mayor of London. I mean, they're all of the Indian subcontinent in some form or shape, really. And industry, Barclays, you know, all, all of the organizations, there are many CEOs in that as well. So what is it? I'd like your thoughts because I know you're not uh, British Indian in that sense, but what do you think is the identity of an Indian in Britain today? Well, I think I'd say that, uh, you know, it depends really if you're a citizen here and you're planning to live the rest of your life here, you need to assimilate. Uh, that's been the traditional Indian view. If you are somebody who is still an Indian passport holder who happens to be working here with every intention of staying affiliated to your country of origin and one day returning there, which is why you've still kept the passport, then I think your orientation has to be different. So it depends very much on each individual case. When we see you all in a room, we think of you all as alike, but actually individual people have different plans and, and orientations. And there may be somebody here who divides her time between both countries. There may be somebody here who, um, who um, uh, lives here uh, all year round hasn't been to India in a decade. There might be somebody here who's just come from India and is trying to figure out whether they have a future here or want to, want to go back. So each person is different. So I, I wouldn't want to generalize Rajesh, but my, my objective answer is if you are trying to be British, then I think you should, it should be very clear that's your first loyalty. 
Um, you happen to be a Briton of Indian origin. Yes, there are Britons of, of Irish origin or Britons of, of, of some other, some other origins. In fact, it's striking actually that a number of the names I hear are being talked about in British politics are all people from different national backgrounds. There's a minister of Kurdish background. There's a minister of, uh, you know, German background and so on and so forth. So why, why shouldn't you have people of Indian background in that spirit? Uh, but if you are, as I say, still essentially Indian who happens to be in Britain, it's a totally different answer. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak thank to us you. today. Much appreciated. I'd love to hear your views on you know, rising Hinduphobia and Islamophobia, both domestically within India, but also in the Indian subcontinent. Also in the English? Indian subcontinent. The Indian subcontinent. Well, look, I mean, the thing is that um, we're facing a bit of a challenge, particularly in recent times, because um, of, I believe, and this is where Mr. Mehta may disagree with me, but I will say it, I believe there is a conscious political strategy of polarization being pursued by the ruling party. I mean, essentially, when uh, in the 1980s, the BJP embarked on what's become its current course, uh, we had had what is called the Mandal movement, which was for granting reservations to the other backward classes. Ambedkar had granted reservations in government jobs, in parliament, all sorts of places too the scheduled castes and tribes, essentially the Dalits and the, and the Adivasis. Um, the other backward classes, the sort of lower castes in, in the sort of intermediate and lower caste, uh, they got reservations in the 80s. Now at that point, a lot of political parties began to fragment a bit, including uh, parties spun off from the Congress party, parties spun off the Socialist Party, to represent the interests of these smaller groups. So. Uh, let's face it, you know, the Yadavs formed a party which in turn split into a party in UP, the Samajwadi party and a party in Bihar, uh, that sort of thing. That, that, was, that was not surprising. Uh, but they were all representing smaller interests. The BJP at that point had the insight that if we go this way, there'd be no one left who thinks of himself principally as a Hindu, be thinking of himself as a Yadav, as a Brahmin, as a, uh, as a whatever, you know, as a secular person and so on. So let us do something that will unite a significant number of Hindus around a consciousness of Hindu identity. This is how I interpret their political strategy around what was known as the Ram Janmabhumi movement, where they said this mosque, the Babri Masjid, is sitting on the site of what most Hindus believe to be, most North Indian Hindus believe to be, the birthplace of Lord Ram, and we want it back for a temple, and, and this mosque must go. And they started a movement, um, initially involving a famous Rath Yatra throughout the country, led by the then BJP president, LK Advani, uh, and uh, they started stirring up passions and they started saying, you know, uh, say with pride that you're a Hindu. Garu se kaho ki tum Hindu hai. Now this uh, message began to resonate, but it took time to pick up steam. So the BJP, which had two seats in the elections of 1984, uh, ended up with um, 86 seats in the elections of 1989, 116 in 91. Uh, five years later, it was 180 odd, and so it went up and with 186 in 1998 and uh, 1999, they formed a coalition government of 26 parties and they formed the government for the first time. But because they had to ally with a lot of parties that didn't share this ideology, there were still some limits to how it, how it went. But this remained their core message. Try and get as many Hindus in your electorate as possible. Uh, the country is 80% Hindu. If even half of your 80% decide to vote for you, uh, you're home and dry because there are so many other parties that the remaining 60 will be fragmented into multiple parties. That's the political strategy as I've understood it. And on that basis, you've seen the BJP steadily rising. Mr. Modi is probably the best orator uh, in Hindi the country has ever seen. He's a, he's a phenomenally effective speaker. He inspires the masses. He has a reputation for personal integrity for getting things done and all of these things these messages are going through there's a certain amount of what you might call micro welfare schemes build toilets in villages uh, give gas cylinders to women who are cooking on charcoal or firewood or whatever um, try and make gestures uh, send a six thousand rupee check every three months to farmers this sort of thing make gestures that that show ordinary people the majority of voters that the government is working for you and then politically drive home a message of Hindu nationalism. That's, that's broadly speaking what they do. Now with that message, 31% is all they had in 19, uh, in 2014, but they won the election. They won a majority of seats. 
In 2019, they won even more seats uh, with just 37 percent. Today, the polls suggest they're somewhere near 40 percent. So it, it's, it's, it's a tactic that is working. I mean, it's very difficult to say uh, that it's not. But the result has been that it's emboldened a lot of what the Marxists would call lumpen elements who go around behaving in the most obnoxious <laughs> way in the name of their Hindu identity in ways that many Hindus absolutely don't agree with. So, you know, you have story after story uh, of, you know, uh, Muslims being tied to a tree and flogged until they say Jai Shri Ram, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, a Muslim dairy farmer with a permit to transport cattle being essentially lynched uh, uh, on the grounds that he was planning to kill the cattle and, and cow slaughter uh, was offensive to these people. He was actually a dairy farmer and he had a license, but it didn't help. Uh, incidents like that, one after the other, some kid returning from Eid shopping, dressed very visibly Muslim, uh, on a train, gets beaten up and thrown off the train, dies. You know, incident after incident like this. Now, what Hindutva apologists will tell you is, you know, in a vast country of 1.4 billion people, why are you exaggerating the significance of, of half a dozen incidents? It's a big country, these things will happen. That's, that's essentially the answer. But they unfortunately are seen by both sides of the debate as constituting a certain pattern. And that pattern is one of, um, of uh, for lack of a better word, of, of discrimination against a particular minority, in this case, the Muslim minority. And it's sort of uh, anchored in history. Uh, they ruled before the British, etc. They were, came as invaders. They destroyed our temples. They, they attacked all of this. And those of us who say, for God's sake, you know, first of all, history is never quite so simple. There were different experiences in different places. You're only choosing certain bad incidents and focusing on them. But even if all that you say is true, how is it relevant today? For, for God's sake, a wound that healed 500 years ago. Let's move on. Let's focus on the future. But people don't find that in their political interest. And so they keep harping on these things. So we are, we are living with history being conjured up to be used as a battle axe. And that's the struggle for India's soul. Is India's soul... Uh, one where everyone is equal and at home, as the constitution says, and has the same rights and can dream the same dreams? Or is India's soul really a Hindu soul in which others can only partake from the side? Shashi, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've heard Kashmir you. Come in. Kashmir come in then. What happened to the Hindus there? No, what happened to the Hindus there was absolutely unforgivable. I'm not saying that it was in any way excusable. But that I would blame terrorism and I would say that uh, our governments needed to do a lot more at the time. To, to prevent and reverse the effects of terrorism. Don't forget, we've had very many terrorist attacks. In Kashmir, they were unfortunately a particularly small and vulnerable majority. I was married to a Kashmiri Pandit who lost her home. I've been to her home in the village in Kashmir with security protection, and I've seen it reduced to rubble. Uh, and the fact is that the same village, the Muslim people there greeted her as a, as a sister who had returned. So the love and affection they showed her was remarkable, but her home was gone. And, and it had been first attacked by terrorists and subsequently vandals had looted every window frame, every door hinge, everything. Everything was gone. And the point is that I know what these people have suffered. But it's also true that the then government, which is not a Congress party government, despite the, 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 the false story in the, in the Kashmir files, the then government said, we can't protect you. We, we just don't have the means to protect every individual pundit family. So many of them left. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't a blot on our history. All I'm saying is deal with each problem on its own merits. And certainly I'm not saying you shouldn't deal with it. But I do say that a problem that occurred 500 years ago in the demolition of a temple uh, or, or the, the construction of a, of a mosque on top of a temple 300 years ago should not be a problem 300 years later today. And we shouldn't, it seems to me, create... Is everyone all right? Uh, we shouldn't, it seems to me, create... Um, I mean, in the proclaimed attempt to right an old wrong, we should not create a new wrong for the future. Uh, we talked about identity of Indians living in British, but yeah. uh, I'm slightly intrigued to pick your brain about recently Boris Johnson visited India in the hopes of getting a trade agreement. Right. Uh, and uh, the revoked post-study work visa is being rolled back. And as we see... Uh, after Brexit, there is a lot of labor shortage in this country. So what do you think is the role of India in terms of the growth of British economy going forward or in the next five or 10 years? 
Well, I think it could be very significant. I think trade would be, a trade agreement uh, would be very valuable to both countries. And the British certainly wanted because some of their goods, which Indians like, such as Scotch whiskey, but also automobile parts and other things are, are very highly, uh, I mean, are subject to rather high tariffs. I think a, a bottle of whiskey has 140%, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, duty coming into India. And, and automobile parts are also pretty high, highly, highly taxed. And, and there are other things that Britain would like to sell, which it can because it does produce some rather high quality um, engineering goods, which, which Indians could use. Uh, but which Indians can't afford really to buy in any quantity unless there's lower tariffs. So free trade agreement with a lot of good. The problem is in England isn't that interested in, in Indian goods beyond what it's already buying. So what would India get in return? An agreement is always both sides, right? What India is saying is you have goods, we have people. Why is it that until just a year ago, an Indian student coming out of a British university could only work for two months legally on a work permit? Whereas a Chinese student could work for three years. And that's finally been fixed after many years of agitation. And it's now uh, two years as well for an Indian and I think for everyone. But the, within that, there is a list of preferred countries and India is not on it. Why aren't we preferred when a lot of other countries without this deep historical connection the Brits like to talk about are benefiting and we're not? Um, what about work permits? It's not we don't want to lose our people. We want them to get experience here, put some money in the bank and come back to India and contribute to our own country. But why shouldn't you make it possible for us to do that? So my own thinking about this is we should drive a hard bargain. We know what Britain wants. We know what Britain can get out of it. And I think it'll do a lot of good to Britain, especially after the exit from the EU. It's important that Britain develop new markets and the British government shows British voters that it's found new markets in the aftermath of Brexit. And I, I think we are obviously a gigantic market for a country like Britain. Uh, but if you want preferential access, you give us preferential access for what we can give you, which happens to be people. So, sorry, we have run out of time on the, we've gone over time on the Q&A. We've got two really important people that we need to hear from before the end. So, Feroza, is Feroza around to be able to talk? So, um, Feroza is going to talk to us a little bit about the importance of the uh, India Club. She's been very gracious in hosting us today as well. So, um, on behalf of the India Club, I would really like to thank Dr. Taru and, and also Smita for your time and really your invaluable insight today. Um, and also the 1928 Institute for organizing such a great event. Um, so, I'm just going to give you a very little bit of uh, background about where we are sitting today. Uh, my name is Feroza and um, the India Club has been run by my family for the past 25 years. Now, in that time, three generations of my family have run the India Club, from my granny behind the um, reception desk <laughs> to my younger sister waitressing in the restaurant. Some of you may say that's a clever way of my dad uh, getting cheap family labor. <laughs> but in reality, it's because we are one of hundreds of families and also individuals who have a very deep attachment to where we are sitting today. Um, the India Club has always been a home away from home for the Indian community. Uh, it, it opened in 1951, and since that time, it offered, you know, a generation of Indians arriving in this foreign, strange country, a ready-made community on their doorstep. Uh, the social significance of where we are has not gone unrecognized, and in 2019, the National Trust ran a month-long exhibition titled The India Club, A Home Away From Home. But what really draws people to this place? Um, the magic of the India Club can be said to be intangible. It's a kind of feeling you get as you walk up the narrow staircase, that you're entering somewhere evocative of your grandparents' stories. It's a building frozen in time, away from the hustle and bustle of modern day London outside. Those who come here can feel its history. Um, it was set up, as touched upon earlier, by Krishna Menon under the, under the India League. And um, it quickly became a hub for political and social groups. You know, it hosted a range of groups from the Indian Workers Association to the Indian Journalists Association. And these were the very groups who worked to make the fabric of our identity in the UK today. To this day, very little has changed. Um, it remains one of the very few buildings in the capital pertaining to migrant experience and South Asian heritage, which has not been repurposed or redeveloped. 
And um, in fact, we get very scolded by our customers if we try to make even the smallest change. Like they notice even if we make a lick of paint on the walls, they'll get very angry with us. Um, so yeah, I would like to round off by thanking everyone very much for coming today. And just one last, um, I'd like to do a little shout out to my dad, uh, Yadga Marker, who shies away from the limelight, but who really is the heart and engine of the India Club. Um, and um, through, through, through his hard work, it ensures that you know, everyone can keep enjoying the India Club in its full glory. We're just going to hear from uh, one more very important person, uh, which is Nikita from the 1928 Institute, who is going to just give her closing remarks um, for this event. So first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Theroux for attending and giving up so much of his precious time. Thank you so much. You've really given us a lot of food for thought. I'd also like to thank the Theroux family for also helping to facilitate this and for coming. It's great that you know we can be a part of your history and you be a part of this. We're all in it together. Lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. This wouldn't happen if you know there wasn't so much interest. And I know it's a bit tight and I know it's very hot, but thank you for bearing with us. And lastly, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't give our little institute a plug. So please do, if you're interested, do follow us, the 1928 Institute, on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, we have it all. And if you're interested in future events such as these, please do join our mailing list on our website. You can see at the bottom. If not, it's welcome at 1928institute.org. And yeah, we'd love to hear more from you, what kind of events you'd like. And we we do more than just host events. Of course, we like to do research. We like to co-create research with our community. We collaborate with great people such as Shalina Patel of the History Corridor. So do check her work out as well. It's amazing. And with that, I know everybody loves to get a drink and love to get a bit of food. So I'll draw this evening to a close. Thank you all for coming.